Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to the fathers who are here today. Um, we do have a message that sort of connects with fathers today. Uh, but I want to share with you first a few of the announcements that are on the back of your bulletin. We have coming up on Thursday the next Ladies Coffee and Conversation here at 9 30. Um, always open to anyone new. If you'd like to invite someone to come, please do. Let them know it's open to anyone. You don't have to go to any church at all. Just uh, like coffee and conversation or tea. Beverage of choice. Um, also, we have coming up, it, we'll have it on the 4th of July. I've had a couple people ask if that was a typo. <laughs> I checked. <laughs> it, we checked. It will be taking place on July the 4th. Um, also, a reminder there about our charge wide worship and picnic that's coming up July the 28th. We're going to have a butterfly release as part of the service. And you can see there's an order form there if you'd like to sponsor a butterfly in honor or memory of loved ones. And uh, we need those orders and payment by July the 15th. If you have any questions, just let me know. And uh, I had somebody ask, can you sponsor a butterfly if you can't make it? Yes, you can. Absolutely, there's no reason not to. Um, I did have this I wanted to read to you now as opposed to try to remember to do it when we do the joys and concerns because, I don't know, long day. Um, but I wanted to share this card that we received, which is a lovely handmade card, by the way. I will leave it here so that it can be posted. It says, Dear Pastor and the members of the Soup Kitchen, we want to take this opportunity to thank you for your generous donation to the Historic Par Historical Paradise Church Cemetery Association. Your donation will be applied to our fund to restore the church monument and signed from uh, the association members. But it is a lovely card. Um, they did do some wonderful work yesterday, so we'll talk a little bit more about that during the Joys and Concerns because other people can remember to talk about that. Um, any other announcements that we should share at this point? And seeing that, I want to share with you our centering words on this day. As we begin a new series, we're going to be doing three Sunday series on the Trinity, starting with God as Father. The God of the universe is expressed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's diversity in unity, multiple and yet singular, three in one. Please rise and body your spirit as you feel led, and join together as we prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the Sanctuary Song. <coughs> Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Please turn in the hymnal to number 445 to sing together the opening hymn, Happy the Home When God is There. Lord, when we think about those small seeds that many of us have been planting, or have already planted, the little seed that contains the life of a mighty shrub, it is awe-inspiring of your creative and life-giving power. We only 
see the small seed. In fact, when we bury it, we see it no more. But you see the great potential in everything that you have created because of what you put into it. And we often dismiss the smallest things as though they are insignificant. But you treat all things precious. You give value to truth because it is valuable. Where in today's world, truth is whatever you want to make it. And so life in your presence is also wondrous. It's so different when we think about it on your terms. The gifts that we have and that we have brought for use, for helping others, for healing, for ministries of hope, we know that you will do good things through them. We've gathered today to hear your word and to look into our lives to discover the needs we have. We've offered to you prayers for others in situations of distress and struggle and grief, for those who are rejoicing as well, because this world always has its beauty and its sorrow, and they exist side by side. We're confident that you hear and respond to our prayers, and we place our trust, we place our lives in your love and seek to serve you. We ask to be, you be with us and guide us and take the small seeds of our spirits and cause them to blossom into lives that will honor and glorify your holy name. You've called us to be a people of prayer, so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now that we have um, reconciled with God, let us reconcile with one another. Please rise and pass the peace of Christ in any way that's comfortable for you. Now that we're back in our seats, we're going to prepare our hearts to hear the word of the word proclaimed by singing our hymn of preparation. And this we're going to remain seated for. This is 472. We're going to sing together, Near to the Heart of God. Oh uh -huh. 
Trinity Sunday, I had lamented a little bit about the fact that we don't linger very long on the Trinity, and the Trinity is something that people argue about in the church. So I thought it would be very helpful to be able to dig a little deeper into each expression of the Holy Trinity. And so today we're going to begin with God as the Father. A good father loves, a good father disciplines, and a good father equips us to try new things while also giving us the freedom and opportunities to actually be tested. And so in the Trinity, in these expressions, God our Father provides us provision, sacrifice, and proximity. I'm going to read first from 1 Corinthians. And in this passage, you know, fathers do, as I said, extend a certain amount of freedom. Anybody's father let them get away with a little bit more than their mother? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right, so you've experienced that. Um, and then usually it would be to see how you did, right? And they tell you how you did. Okay, so they, they would give you a little bit of latitude with that. They would reprove whether or not you did well or whatnot. So you'll hear that word again in another verse later. But I want to read for you in, in this particular passage that that testing goes on in the people in the church too. So it's not just in our families at home where the oldest sibling is like the test subject for all the other siblings. <laughs> and so the other siblings will learn from the first one, right? That happens in the church. We've got the older and more experienced seasoned people that are serving as the oldest siblings in the church. Did you ever think about that? But it's true. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 13. Freedom with responsibility. I am going to read this particular passage from the message paraphrase, but I would like you to read this in your own Bibles because I think it's helpful to hear the In Other Words version, but you should reinforce it always with... Uh, a, more of a word-for-word -word translation. The question keeps coming up regarding meat that has been offered up to an idol. Should you attend meals where such meat is served or not? We sometimes tend to think we know all we need to know to answer these kinds of questions, but sometimes our humble hearts can help us more than our proud minds. We never really know enough until we recognize that God alone knows it all. Some people say quite rightly that idols have no actual existence, that there's nothing to them, that there is no God other than our one God, that no matter how many of these so-called gods are named and worshipped, they still don't add up to anything but a tall story. They say, again quite rightly, that there is only one God the Father, that everything comes from Him, and that He wants us to live for Him. Also, they say that there is only one master, Jesus, the Messiah, and that everything is for his sake, including us. Yes, it's true. In strict logic, then, nothing happened to the meat when it was offered up to an idol. It's just like any other meat. I know that, and you know that, but knowing isn't everything. If it becomes everything, some people end up as know-it-alls who treat others as know-nothings. Real knowledge isn't that insensitive. We need to be sensitive to the fact that we're all, or that we're not all at the same level of understanding in this. Some of you have spent your entire lives eating idol meat, and are sure that there's something bad in the meat that then becomes something bad inside of you. An imagination and conscience shaped under those conditions isn't going to change overnight. But fortunately, God doesn't grade us on our diet. We're neither commended when we clean our plate, nor reprimanded when we just can't stomach it. But God does care when you use your freedom carelessly in a way that leads a fellow believer still vulnerable to those old associations to be thrown off track. For instance, say you flaunt your freedom by going to a banquet thrown in honor of idols where the main course is meat sacrificed to idols. Isn't there great danger if someone still struggling over this issue, someone who looks up to you as knowledgeable and mature, sees you go into that banquet? The danger is that he will become terribly confused, maybe even to the point of getting mixed up himself in what his conscience tells him is wrong. Christ gave up his life for that person. Wouldn't you at 
least be willing to give up going to dinner for him? Because, as you say, it doesn't really make any difference. But it does make a difference if you hurt your friend terribly, risking his eternal ruin. When you hurt your friend, you hurt Christ. A free meal here and there isn't worth it at the cost of even one of these weak ones. So never go to these idle, tainted meals if there's any chance it will trip up one of your brothers or sisters. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So we're building on the message last week where we spoke about family, the temporal family, the eternal family, and we're still hearing that language, brothers and sisters, and, and it's so deeply reinforced. Um, but I wanted to begin with this passage, and then I'm going to be reading the other passages, but it's going to be throughout the message. And <clears throat> actually, I'm going to show you where we have one of those expressions of the different essence of the, the Trinity, because we've talked about it before, and there's so many different adjectives you could use to describe those three parts. Um, but they are diversity and un unity, multiple yet singular, three in one. But there's an application applied, and we can see it very clearly in something we've already looked at in the past couple of weeks, but it's the end of that second letter to the church in Corinth. So this is uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. And it's how he ends his letter, and it's really to give us these wonderful, just one word descriptions of that, of, of that uh, essence of each of the parts of the Trinity. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now to me, that really reinforces provision in God, sacrifice in Jesus, and proximity through the Holy Spirit. But Paul's reminder of the Trinitarian nature of God emphasizes the intimate involvement of God in your lives. That God is not this distant idol that's sitting on a stand over in Greece, or wherever it is that they're worshiping a God of this and a God of that. Um, and, and trying to reinforce no more of this kind of thing, but more of a family structure, was something Jesus worked very hard to do. One of the clearest sources of the nature of God as Father is Jesus himself. I mean, we read it throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament too, but for me personally, it was through Jesus himself. It's important to remember, Jesus understood and appreciated he had an earthly father, Joseph. And that earthly father did raise him just as any father would, to even to every tradition that they had, including teaching him his trade. He was a carpenter like his father, like Joseph. And he was 100% human. A 100% human human has a father. Did you know that? Science. And he's also, unlike us, 100% divine. And that's because of that wonderful prophecy we read in the Old Testament coming into be, and he is 100% divine because of his divine Father. Now, we're 100% human, but like Jesus, we have access to a heavenly Father. We have our Father of blood or bond in this life. We have our Father that we can access our heavenly Father who will adopt us into his heavenly family eternally through Jesus the Son and lead us as the family of God with help and leading from the Holy Spirit. So it's when Jesus was teaching the disciples from me that this was particularly driven home when he said, here is how you should pray, our Father. That's simple. Two words, our Father. If you remember last week, we talked in the mass, uh, passage from Mark how Jesus was trying to reframe this idea of the eternal family in God, eternal family in him. When you are in Christ, you're in this family. When he's teaching them inside and Mary and his brothers show up outside and they say, oh, wait, Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. And he's reinforcing, oh, wait a second. You are my brothers. Not discounting or discrediting who's outside. He's reinforcing who is in the room because they are just as important to him as anyone. We see him at the cross. He's going to leave this earthly realm. And he provides family of birth and bond by saying to Mary, Mary, 
this is your son, pointing to John, and says to John, John, this is your mother. God gives us provision, even family, where relationships, some are temporary, some are eternal. We have family of blood and we have family of bond. Now what Jesus was doing and trying to do that was just blowing their minds because there were a lot of widows and orphans who really mastered the idea of that temporary family. And to have an option to have this eternal one was wonderful. And it was really interesting too because Jesus is saying, you can know God because you can know me. If you know me and you see me, you see God. You can know God. And not only that, he can be your father too. He can be your heavenly father as well. It's interesting because I've never heard of a story where a prince goes around the countryside saying, hey, my dad's the king. I'm a prince. Do you want him to adopt you? This is the only such story I have ever heard, which is very interesting. But it's when we say that Lord's Prayer that we get so much of the meat of this. He's really driving it home every time we say that prayer. When we say, thy kingdom come, we're talking to God. We're saying God's kingdom can be made to come to earth a little bit and a little bit in and through us. We get to do that. And what we're saying is, thy kingdom come in and through us and our kingdom go. If we're going to make this world a little more like the one perfected in heaven, we have to mean what we say. It's a picture of God that the earthly church writers just grabbed a hold of and they expressed in their letters, just like the one from the Apostle John, who wrote to the church in 1 John 3, 1, about the patient father. Because... There are a lot of different expressions of fathers that people will understand and tend, they tend to pick one that's going to mirror the earthly father they have. Well, these, in, the, in this case, they're talking about gods, the angry, vengeful gods. And so this is very different. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. And it's true, they didn't know him. There are people who live their entire life having heard of God, having heard things about God, believing they know God on their own terms, and they leave this world never knowing God. I know who George Clooney is. I've seen George Clooney in movies and the facts of life. But I don't know George Clooney. And I know that difference. But then again, he doesn't know me, so. <laughs> Jesus wrote in the book of Revelation referring to the wedding of the Lamb. It's another fami familial thing. He's talking about this marriage between heaven and earth, bringing them together. And in the New Testament, we hear Jesus talking about himself as the bridegroom, the church as the bride. These are things that provide family, right? When Brian and I got married, we went into the church as, as you and me, and we came out as us and we. I went in as a Chandler and came out as a Heiser, just like that. And a few years later, we, two became four. And you know what we were called? The Heisers. And the family of God is the family of God. The body of Christ is the body of Christ. No matter how many people come and go or who comes and who goes. It just keeps going. But the problem is not so much that people can't understand it, it's that they don't know, they've never heard. There are a lot of people that have never heard any of these kinds of ideas of family in the church. And they don't really have a whole lot of family around them. But the idea that they could have a sort of those kinds of relationships would be wonderful and welcome news. And like I said, this is why we hear about widows and orphans. Churches to take care of the widows and orphans. 
or to reach out or to help, or to be a safe place, a place where you can be fed and, and loved, not just food, but I mean heart food. And John is emphasizing this relationship of family that Jesus has invited us to, and that the same invitation is open to others, they just don't know. And they don't know because they don't know God. They really don't know God. They are measuring God according to their terms, and they're using all sorts of different things in their life experience and bringing it to that measure. And so in that time, they were talking most in, in the Middle Eastern setting about gods who were not what you would consider a father figure. So if you think about fatherly figures on TV, you've got Mr. Walton, you've got uh, Ward Cleaver, you've got Mr. Brady, you know, pick the, pick the one of your choice. But these were not father figures. These were angry, terrifying, always vengeful, always irritated and disappointed gods. And they would go and they'd make their, they'd bring their offering, and if they would only get what they wanted if they, if the god was in a good mood that day and liked their offering. It's like that is not the god. That's not the god that we have. And it's, it is what a lot of people still think today, because they still think God's just waiting. For us to screw up. But when Jesus and John, well, when John said, you know, both of them, they're saying, look at this God. This, he's like a father who lavishes love upon his children. That is not at all like those gods they're used to. There are people who still believe even today God's just waiting for them to screw up so that he can punish them. Now they think that, but it's not because of God. And there are people who are angry at God. But the fact of the matter is, God's not trying to hide good things from you. God's not trying to prevent you from having a good life. God is not trying to do those things. Someone is. But it's not God. This idea that God's trying to keep good things and fun things and even knowledge from you is a lie that was told in Genesis 3 by a serpent to Adam and Eve. Now, I want to be very clear. Some genuinely struggle to see God as a heavenly father because of their earthly father experience, whether they know it or not. And I lament with everyone who struggles in that way because there's nothing you can do about it, you know? But consider this. Jesus knew the difference between his earthly father, Joseph, and his heavenly father, God. And we know this when he's 12 years old and he... Just something awakens in him at that temple. And he stays. He doesn't, he doesn't feel for whatever reason, because kids know when it's time to go, right? Typically, kids know when it's time to go. When it's time to go home, they're usually excited to go home. I think in that time, he was home. But he was home in a place he didn't understand as home until he was 12. And so when his parents who have told him all of these things that the angels and shepherds and everyone else had confirmed. We're looking for him everywhere else they would look for 12-year-old Jesus, the boy they'd been raising, and came to the temple, maybe to see if they had seen him. I don't know. Why would you be looking all over? Why would you not know I would be in my father's house? They understood there was something that has changed within this 12-year-old Jesus, but they certainly knew that he was the son of God. So having a poor example of an earthly father or a Joseph, this is important because if you know anyone who struggles with this, you need to be able to share this. Having that poor example cannot and will not limit the family relationship you can have with your father, God. It may cause you to need a little bit of extra work to understand it. But God is a patient God, and the agape love of a father, as it was meant to be, is possible. But like any invitation, you have to accept it. There are earthly fathers, Josephs we know, who have children that try their patience, I've heard. You may know one or two. But they will love that child to the ends of the earth because that child is their child. And sometimes they will even say, well, I see a little bit of me in there. <laughs> Right? But you know what else? God sees a little bit of the Trinity in you. That's really important. 
Finally, I want to read just a portion, of pa a passage from Proverbs here, because one of the other things that we, we get from God is discipline. You know those loving fathers, including Ward Cleaver and Mr. Brady and Mr. Walton? If you got in trouble, you got a hug, but you also got a punishment. And that is loving. That's a, a, a less often practiced or performed form of love today because there are parents who would rather move the mountain for the child than teach the child to climb the mountain for themselves. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. We went from helicopter parents to bulldozer parents. Mm -hmm. And it does not do them a, a service at all because they're not prepared. And the fact is parents are temporary and mountains are permanent. You will always encounter a mountain. And we learn self-discipline through discipline. Discipline is also a language of love because it communicates first that we can do it, and usually it's through means of punishment, we must do it. And so in Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, we read, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord, or loathe his reproof. See, God will prove to you over and over, you can do things God's will way even though you might be trying to prove that you won't. <laughs> For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. He still delights the son, but he's going to correct the son. This is true at every age because we never outgrow the need to learn and hone self-discipline. Never. And I've heard people say, oh, after a certain age, you can say whatever you want. No, you can't. You can say you can. No, you can't. Not if you are practicing self-discipline. Not if you're being that older sibling example to those younger siblings in your church. You have to keep practicing that self-discipline. We never outgrow the need to hone self-discipline. Someone's always watching us. Someone's always wanting to see if we're going to go into that idol meat banquet and do what you're telling me I shouldn't do. Or you're telling me it really doesn't matter. But if it didn't matter, why are you there? It can create confusion that we didn't necessarily mean to create. The most loving thing we can experience is learning the best way to conduct ourselves and deal with the challenges of our ever-changing lives because our lives change. They change. And sometimes the things that used to work don't work anymore. And obedience also protects us from harm. It helps us avoid unnecessary suffering. It helps us experience a fullness of life no matter what our situation or circumstances. God disciplines us to help create healthy boundaries for ourselves, to put up our guide rails and guardrails and say, I will not go past this. I will not go past here. And I'm not going there. I don't care how many times the world tells me it doesn't matter and it's not a big deal. I'm not doing it. Because God says it's not a good idea. And I don't care what the world says. I don't answer to the world. I answer to God. And God disciplines in order to correct, help correct behavior that's ultimately harmful. Not only to us, but to people that are around us and connected to us. So that he can redirect his children down paths that lead to life. And isn't that the path that everyone wants for their children in their sphere of influence? We cannot expect our children to do what we're not willing to do. And God does not expect you to do anything Jesus wasn't willing to do. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for creating us to be your children and for loving us enough to discipline us so that we grow and become better representatives of your love here on earth. It's like no other. No matter how long we have known you, you've known us better and continue to know us better than we know ourselves. We have a lot to learn. Please help us to know you better and to see you on your terms as a father and follow your ways. For this we give you thanks, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
You may rise now and join together in our closing hymn number 695. We're going to sing, O Lord, may church and home combine. First and last verse only. Thank you. 